It's time for a Big Blue Kickoff Live. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Prime. And the Giants mobile app. 17-14 is the final. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. That's a fun. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to Tuesday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Giants. Our number here is 201-939-4513. Jot it down. The first half hour of today's program is going to be about you folks and your calls. I know during this NFL Draft Prospect preview time, we've got so many guests that we that we line up to bring you these firsthand accounts of these NFL Draft Prospects that a lot of you guys don't get a chance to chime in. But we're going to try to do that today, at least for the first half hour, before we talk to Softy Mailer from KJR Radio out in Seattle. And he will address the Washington Huskies. And, of course, they've got a slew of prospects in this year's draft. That'll be coming up at the top of the hour. But for the first half hour, your chance to call us at 201-939-4513. I'm Paul Dottino. He's two-time Super Bowl champ Jonathan Casillas. And I've got to tell you something, Jonathan. Uh, the, the one thing about what's happening now, we're in a little bit of a, a dead period for the news. You've got the pro days going on. You've got the visits to the local teams that are going on. And, you know, you and I, in all the years that we've, you know, known each other and worked together or whatever, we've never really talked about what that was like compared to now. Because pro days now, they're even putting them on TV. Yeah. I mean, they're live. You know, you're you're getting them either on NFL Plus, you're getting them on ESPNU. The pro days are now a circus. I don't know. Did you have a pro day when you were at Wisconsin? Yeah, yeah, we 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 had a pro day. Um, I was hurt, so I couldn't do the combine or the pro day. I got invited to the combine, was only able to do bench press and interviews. But uh, yeah, I mean, of course, it wasn't cameras there. Um, you know, it wasn't no media there. It's I mean, a if there was now. media there, the cameras weren't on. You okay. know, because I'm pretty sure there was media there, but mm-hmm. the cameras what weren't on, um, and <clears throat> like you said, it's a circus. But that's how it is now. Everything's recorded nowadays. Social media is a paramount, I think, in publicity and PR stuff for every organization. I mm-hmm. think you know that goes for the colleges to the NFLs, and uh, it, you know it, it is what it is. Everything's on video nowadays, and you know you got to be. I, I think now you can't really get away with anything anymore. You know, I think back in the day you could get away with some stuff. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, like back when we was, they probably still doing it now, but they got to be a little bit more finesse about it. But I remember like pro day, I was a little lighter than I was at the combine. So I just put a little five pound plate. Did you? you? Did you really? (laughs) Because I played, I think my senior year, like maybe 224. And okay. then combine, I was like 230, but I was just smashing waters. Okay. You know, just like trying to be as big as possible. Because I know I wasn't going to run. I know I wasn't doing anything. So I went to weigh in heavy. And then pro day, I was about 225, 224. So I just slipped a little five pound weight. <laughs> like, I don't know if they can get that off now. The camera's going to be on them all the time. Uh, you know what? I wouldn't put it past them. <laughs> uh, you never can tell. You never yeah, no, can tell. you can't tell. Just a little in the, in the tights, you know. In wow, the, in the, in the, in the shorts, how about that? You know. Well, you know, I've heard, I've heard legendary stories from scouts who would say they would go to a school's pro day and they would only find after the pro day was over, some guys were very leery about the 40 times. And I know some guys who actually went back to the field, remeasured the field and found out that the school had yeah, relined yeah. the field. Like 38. Yes. 38 yards. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had cheated. We- the school had helped their, their group of pro day players cheat by shortening the 40 by just a tad. And, and you know what they do too as well, Paul? <laughs> they do like, a, and this is like high level right here. So maybe they keep it at 40, but what they do is. How about the slope? Have you heard that one? Yes. Yeah, there you but go. What I'm talking about <laughs> is a little bit more of, uh, I guess, um, uh, I don't know. They put like a wooden like plank down and then they put like, turf over the plank so it's more of a harder surface oh. so it's almost like you're running on on a street yeah. instead of a soft yeah you know absorbent surface like turf and grasses you know so like that'll get you maybe like a hundred for two of a second <laughs> off hey but every everything matters you know that kid just ran a four two three like you know what i'm saying like right. he made himself some money running that time well they call that home field advantage i like it hey <laughs> 
Listen, man. Do what you can do to help me look better. You know, That's I'll take it. that. <laughs> That's it. You know, and and so there there were so many of these stories over the years, and and I'm sure it is harder to cheat now because technology has kind of taken over, and you yeah. can't really fool the technology as easily. But but it's the gamesmanship. It's funny because what do they always say about coaches and athletes? If you can get an edge, you'll yeah, try. Of course, of course. <laughs> I remember when I was coming out. Um, one of my teammates, his name was uh, Elijah Hodge. His brother Abdul Hodge. He played at Iowa. Then he went on to play at Green Bay. And I remember when I was like coming out, I was like, "Yo, like I need to know like the ins and outs, man. Like how could I finesse?" He was like, "No, nah, don't finesse. No, I'm not. I'm like, I'm not saying that I'm trying to cheat." But I need to know like the things I can and can't do that they not telling me, that my agent's not telling me. Because I know there's some things I can get away with or do to help me get this playbook, to get going. Like, right. you know what I'm saying? Like, that's what I'm talking about. He thought I was trying to cheat or like trying to maneuver my way around working hard. No, I, I'm a work. Right. But like, let me know what, what the edge is. Like, yeah. let me figure out how to get that edge that everybody's not telling me. Edge and, and you would know. Be two different things. Right, right, right. That Like, you would know because you've been in the game. You've yeah. played a couple years, I believe, at the time for the Packers. So you understand that there are some things that you can and can't do, and I want to know the things I can do to help myself get that edge, like you said. Yeah, yeah. So uh, in any event, uh, pro days continue, and, and so do some of the uh, the workouts. They didn't have the local workout rule in, in that day, did they? I just, I just found that out. Is that a new thing, like this year? Or is oh, it no, been it's going? been a for while, a while for a while but i don't think when you played that the local rule was in play no i i didn't know about that i know they got the big 12 uh yeah pro day coming up which i didn't even know was a you thing. have a radius of x number of miles from your program and any schools that are within that radius you get x number of, of local guys who are allowed to work out for you without having to go through your count Understood. Understood. So this is what happened to me, Paul. So I had, when I came out, I got injured my senior year, before my senior season. I played basically injury prone or in, injured, injury rattled my senior year with a, with, a, with a knee. And I ended up electing to get surgery because my knee got progressively worse as the year went right. on. Right before uh, uh, the bowl game, when we played Florida State in the Champ Sports Bowl of Wisconsin. And I, I got my surgery December 17th, I believe, 2008, okay. right, you know, right when I was uh, finishing college. And I was supposedly almost could have been healthy for the combine, but I wasn't because I tweaked my hamstring. So I had a oh. knee and then I pulled my hamstring trying to, you know, get a time. I haven't recorded a 40 yard dash at that point until uh, since my junior year. Okay. I haven't ran full speed. So pro day was only two weeks after the combine. So I couldn't do pro day. I couldn't run at pro day. So all I did was interviews at the combine. I got invited to the senior bowl, couldn't do senior bowl because I was hurt. My agent told me, he said, you need to do something before this draft because everybody thinks your knee is just totally right. messed up. My knee was fine, but I, I couldn't run at the time because of my hamstring. So what I did was at Parisi over here in New Jersey because yeah. I was a New Jersey guy. Is it Elmwood Park or Finlon? It's somewhere. It's yeah. up here somewhere. Yeah. Bergen County yeah. somewhere over, over in this area, like maybe 20, 30 minutes from here, max. Um, and we, I only had like three or four scouts, but I ended up basically just trying to run and just put something out there just to let them know that I'm okay mm -hmm. four days before the draft. And oh, wow. it was only like three scouts there and I didn't run good. I didn't jump good. Like I got the record for the 40 at Wisconsin. I ran four, three, three at 215 pounds. My You're junior kidding me. Year. I had 38 inch vertical, but I was hurt. I literally ran hurt. And this right. is this is how you know I was hurt. After the draft, you know, rookie minicamp starts, what, a week later? Yeah. You know, the guys are and in. Giants do it two <clears throat> weeks later, but yes. Yeah, guys are in like almost immediately after the draft, right? I couldn't even perform for rookie minicamp. I wasn't even healthy for rookie minicamp. Mm. So I ran my 40. I jumped my, my, my vertical. I did all my, my all my performances. I was still injured. But I had to show them that I was at least, because right. they didn't know about my knee. Because it was like, I left the program, basically. But I had a really bad, not really bad, but I had a prolonged knee injury that progressively got worse. And they really didn't know what was going on, as in the scouts and the teams. So my agent was like, you got to do something. You have to put something out there to let them know that you're, you can at least run and do stuff. And I ran like a 4.5. I never ran 4.5 in college. I always ran 4.4 four and under. Wow. My whole time. Like, I was... 
you got to remember, when I was here in New Jersey, I was a three-sport All-State athlete. Right. Basketball, football, and track. And I saw his basketball I, tape, I, I was a I was a sprinter. You know, I was legitly fast. Okay. You know, so uh, it, it hurt me, I think, big time, not being able to show my athleticism mm-hmm. and not being able to perform. But at the point, th- 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 being able to do that pro day, I think, helped me for at least guys to see me, that I can still move around a little bit. Even being hurt, I still ran four or five, which would probably put me in the top five of all linebackers in that draft. At that time, yeah, yeah, yeah probably yeah. did. Yeah, and I don't know if you remember my year coming out. Aaron Curry was oh, the I was the, Aaron Curry. was a linebacker, and I remember like Stanley Arno. He got drafted to the Saints in the fourth round, and I also went to the Saints as an undrafted free agent. Stanley Arno was a really good linebacker. Aaron Curry, when he showed up to the combine, he was like two fifty. He ran like a low four or five, and when you watch him move. Everybody was like, oh, yeah. Even all, all the linebackers. Mind you, Clay Matthews is there. Brian Cushing is there. Mm-hmm. Like, this is a great – Brian Arakpo. Like, this is mm-hmm. a great linebacker class, right? Everybody's like, oh, he's going number one because how he looked at Pro Day. And I don't know if you remember his career. Oh, well, he had a bad knee injury, which was part of the reason why he never fulfilled his promise. He, he didn't really pan out. No. You no. know? and He and, comes into that bust and category. The reason why I'm saying that is because – some of these pro days and these combines, it could be very off off putting to what the player really is, because they might go out there and, and look like everything and, and run really well, test really well, jump high, do everything right, look good in the drills, and then all of a sudden you're like, man, I think this guy's better than the film that he put out there. And let me tell you something, they're not better than the film. It ain't happening. You're not going to look at film and be like, oh, his workouts are better than his film. And then you'll be like, oh, I'm going to draft him because of his workout. And then all of a sudden, you get that film again. That's the guy that shows up. Listen up to this guy, please, folks, because I've had so many scouts over the years tell me people get too carried away with Pro Day. They get too carried away with the Combine, even. And here's a guy who went through the process, saw firsthand, and I'm glad to hear you vocalize your skepticism of how much meat that people put into these things. Yeah, for sure. Like, look, at the end of the day, if a guy can play, he can play. That shows up on film. Yeah. That is 100% it shows up on film, right? Mm-hmm. The workout and all of that, the the measurables and all of that stuff, the, the even the interviews, the drill work, the lie, uh, the the position specific work, which is football stuff, which I think is important. That's secondary to the film. That's secondary. <clears throat> and some people, I think, they put that as a priority, almost the first thing that they look at, and it's like that's wrong. For years, the Raiders and Al Davis right, did that highway speed. It right? was all about that. Yep. It was about the workouts for yep. them, more so than the game tape. It worked, though, for a little bit for them. They oh. were winning back in the 70s <laughs> and, and kind of, then it kind of swooned. <laughs> quick, quick story. Many years ago, scouts told me, and they taught me this, they said they would never lessen a player's grade off of the combine or the pro day. The grade that they gave that guy at the end of the season, as far as his playing grade, not the intangibles that go into the folder, but the playing grade, that grade stays. Now, if the medicals or the interviews or the intangibles come up bad, that's a different story. Right. But as far as his football skills, the playing grade would never, ever be dropped off a pro day or a combine. Now, what they said to me was, what could happen, and this is the most that would ever happen, and I was told it was very rare, is that if a guy had a really good combine and a really good pro day, they, uh, the scouts would go back, rewatch the game tape again to confirm something that they saw or something that they may have missed. The most that they would possibly do is maybe bump that grade up by half a point. Yeah. That's it. By half a point. So when you folks out there are seeing, hearing, and reading that over the course of the last three months, when no one has played right. another college football game, that a guy has jumped from the third round to the first <laughs> round, that ain't half a point, fellas. Yeah, that ain't it. That ain't yeah. half a point. That's a hell of a lot more than that. Yeah. Okay? That that's 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 the freight train running down the hype the hype track. Yeah. Is what I that mean, is. It, it, it's all a gamble too, you know, because 
you look at the college film and let's say you have a guy I'll, I'll bring this guy up too and he's a friend of mine still to this day he played for the, the Jets for a while he was like a top six pick overall Vernon Golston mm-hmm. Vernon Golston had a heck of a senior year okay. I watched him have four sacks against Wisconsin he, he was supposed to be a Jets just, beast of a linebacker he destroyed us and then he went to the combine and ran like a high four six he put up the bench like 150 times he's strong I mean he looked like the part, and he, he performed well. He got drafted very high, mm-hmm. and then I played against him, and and I went against him on special teams, and I was a guy that was you know coming off an of injury my rookie year, and you know two hundred and twenty five pounds max. I went against him on special teams, Paul. He wasn't nothing. The two guys <laughs> who for years were the poster child for the fake grades coming off of the combine and the workouts were Vernon Golston and Mike Mamula, defensive Mike. end for the Philadelphia Mamula. Eagles. What year was this? I was, I, was, I was going to say... Um, Mamula was a pass rusher for the Eagles, a defensive end linebacker. Jamarcus Russell. Because remember when Jamarcus yeah, Russell oh, did sure. the combine or, or the pro days, he was throwing like 80 yards on the knee. That, and it's like, that, first of all, you're never going to throw from your knee. <laughs> Because you can't throw from your knee in the NFL. You're you're down. <laughs> Let's see. Mamula was drafted in what year? What class? A- 85. Yeah, First a round pick by Philadelphia in 1985. And, uh, you know, he was a, a hybrid linebacker, defensive end, who for his career had 31 and a half sacks in five NFL seasons. And when he came out, he was what they called a workout warrior because he destroyed all the drills. And his overall pick was... Let me find it. Seventh overall. Wow. Mike Mamula. Mike Mamula. I've never heard of him. Oh, yeah. I mean, go go you know, take a, a look. Bit at, older go, than... See if there's some YouTube. I don't know if there's even enough highlights to make a, a YouTube of video of him. But he, uh, for years, he was the poster child. And then Vernon Goldston was also another one of those poster childs. Yeah. And, and it was like, don't be fooled by these guys. Because, you know what? The more stock you put <clears> in postseason stuff, the more likely you're going to get fooled. And and there's something into the level of competition. And I think those numbers can be deceptive, you know, because if you're bigger, stronger, and faster than collegiate guys, you probably beat most of the guys you go against. Yeah, but now you got to step up. But in the NFL, if you're bigger, stronger, and faster, that might give you your edge. But there's other guys that maybe aren't fast mm-hmm. and doesn't have long arms, but they played 10 years in the league. Why did they play 10 years in the league? Yeah, that and their technique is flawless. And their heart. There's a, there's a lot that goes into oh, it. Oh, there's a lot that goes into and it. And it's not just the physicals which you can look at exactly. when you start looking at, oh, because we're going to we're gonna do Washington soon, and then we're going to bring up the, the draft grades, and mm-hmm. we're going to bring up what people say. There's nothing on there that can show us that they're a really good football player or not. That's right. Like, that'll show us the potential, but not is he a good football player. You have to look at that. You have to see that. You have to be around it. Yep. That's how you prove they're a good football player. That's the extra level of intangibles that we can't do here. Well, we would have why, to be there and watching them play, talking to them people in person. That's why during these preview shows, this is what we do. We, we call on the radio and the TV analysts who do these games all the time. That got their eyes on those They guys. see these guys every week, yep. every play. I'd much rather hear from them about a guy than the five minutes of cut-up tape that I'm looking at. Yep. To, you know, I, I could tell you something, but I really trust our guys who, who are out there in the field, and that's why we work so hard to get a good network of people to bring uh, our, our previews to you. All right, we're going to go to our phone calls real quick. We only got about 10 minutes to get to these quick calls. Uh, once again, you, uh, you can find an archive of this show and our entire pa- podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcast. Sorry for the detour, but I did, did think that was an interesting conversation because we've never had that and never on the air before. And I think it takes people a little bit inside uh, as to uh, what's going on at this time of year. All right, let's go to Elijah on line two in Ohio. You're first on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. Hey, I was wondering why – I had a question. I was wondering why nobody's talking about Tommy DeVito, which I know he's undrafted. He was – Well, um, he's under contract. You know, Elijah, I'm with you too, bro. I just yeah, said that the other day. Rookie, I just said it the other day. And everybody, I listened to 
to people talk about him and they think he's not any good. I'm, I don't quite understand because everybody thinks Bryce Young and Will Levis are really good. And they were drafted, but they didn't have nearly, like, their season wasn't really much better than his, and he was playing behind probably one of the worst offensive lines in history. Elijah, I'm only going to I'm only going to I, I can only give you this. He's under contract to the Giants for the upcoming season. So there's not a lot of questions. We know he's going to be here at training camp through the spring, through training camp, and will have the opportunity to compete for a job. That much we know. So yeah. that's probably why you don't hear a lot of conversation because People are wondering, like, well, what's going to happen? Is he going to be re-signed? Is he going to go somewhere else? No, no. He's here to compete. But I think Elijah's yeah, point is, is that there's, like, Some you said it now, but, that. like, Elijah, how many times have you heard since this offseason started, and I'm with you with this because I haven't heard it at all, that you said what you said just now about him, but no one else has said that. No one else is bringing yeah. him up for the Giants' starting job this year at all. Nobody. Well, not. I don't think to be a starter. I think he's here to compete to be a backup. But, but even when we're talking about when they signed Drew Luck, right? right. And they're giant, and, and everybody like this is critics because you know I gotta I, I gotta listen to what's going on. You know I'm listening to, to different people. I, I love to listen to ESPN, the analysts, and and everybody you know that's that's talking Giants stuff just to get different perspective. They're talking about oh the Giants need to bring in or, or draft a rookie quarterback. The Giants need to bring in a veteran before they, they, they sign Drew Locke. Then they sign Drew Locke. Okay, Drew Locke's going to be the starter day one. Like, I, no one has brought his name up, like, at all. And I just said this, like, a week ago because mm-hmm. they were talking about uh, a Drew Locke versus somebody else if the Giants need to bring in if Daniel Jones is not healthy. No consideration for Tommy DeVito whatsoever. And I was sitting there like, yo, why they keep playing my boy Tommy DeVito? And I think, Elijah, I think it's because he was undrafted. Right, mm-hmm. he doesn't have the yep. measurables as some of these other guys, right? And if Drew, if Tom Brady would have would have came in for Drew Blesso like he did, and he would have had let's say a sub five hundred year that year, Tom Brady the next year he wasn't the, he wouldn't be the incumbent starter mm-hmm. because of his draft status because of his his physical tools, right? Like he he he's not blowing people off the board. In any type of way, but he was a winner. So that's why I think somebody like a Tom Brady got the acknowledgement because he won. It's hard, and and like you said, Elijah, it, Giants didn't play well this year at all on offense. Like basically the entire year, you know, you could pick pick apart games, but consistently the Giants' offense struggled. No matter who played quarterback, and the Giants had three quarterbacks playing for him last year, mm-hmm. right? Tommy DeVito, I think, did a very good job for what he had. And I think he sure. has some potential to be a good player in this league. Maybe not a starter forever, but a backup is a potential starter in the NFL. When you're a backup, second string, you're a potential starter. As we saw last year, a lot of quarterbacks went down. I think Tommy DeVito is a very capable player in this NFL, mm-hmm. and I'm with Elijah. I don't understand why he's not getting, I think, respect that he deserved because he put it out there last year. Elijah, I will also say this. The, the angry mob out there who was frustrated and disappointed about what's happened with the Giants over the last year, they're more concerned with, oh, got to get rid of Daniel Jones, got to draft a top six quarterback. You know, they're so, so focused on how are they going to push Daniel Jones aside that they don't have much breath left <laughs> for talking about Tommy DeVito. Okay. <laughs> And, 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 you know, but, hey, it is what it is, right? You know, because a lot of yep. the media feeds into the angry mob syndrome. We get that. So I will say this. Tommy DeVito's under contract. If the Giants draft a developmental quarterback, he's going to have a hard time making the 53. Yeah. If they draft a developmental. It's yep. going to be very hard for him to but, do. But that's this 53. For this 53 this year. Right. Right. If the Giants decide that they do all going to draft the developmental and then try to wave him to the practice squad, I bet he gets claimed. Yeah, because he put it on film last yeah. year that he's a capable quarterback and we, in the NFL. We've had that conversation before on this program I, because what you're talking about has got to be about other people because we've talked about Tommy a lot yeah, but, on this program. Right, we we have. Yeah. You yeah. have for sure because we give him respect. Because well, we we've also know what we're talking about. Right. <laughs> but like I'm with him. I watch a lot of other people's opinions and perspectives about the Giants. I want to hear what other people are right. talking about. No one talks about Tommy DeVito. You're right. You're no right. one. I, I, I really, I believe he gets claimed. 
If they try, oh, yeah, to, if they for try sure. to pass him through, I think he gets claimed. For sure. All right. Thanks so much, Elijah. Appreciate it. 201-939-4513. Uh, Wilson is on line one. Uh, we go to you next on BBKL. Hello. Jonathan, dímelo. Dímelo, papi. What's going on? Hey, <laughs> uh, and Jonathan, I want to ask you something. Um, Paulie, you know the other day uh, when I asked you, you know, that the Giants, will, the moves that they made, they will, it, it looks like they're playing for now. They don't want to They don't want to wait for the future. And Lance almost had a heart attack next year. Uh, remember? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I wanna, I, let me ask. All right. Uh, and Jonathan, I'm going to ask you both of you guys something because I asked this the other day and I, they told me I was crazy. Why is such – why is – why can I just say – why why – Brian Dable does not have to coach for his job this year. Why is this like presumption that whatever happens this year, oh, it, it, he's still a great head coach, and, and there's no doubt on everybody's mind that he's got to come back for the fourth year. And I said, no. I said, he's got to coach for it. If the Giants don't make the playoffs this year, and if the Giants are a dumpster fire, I don't want to see this guy again. I'm thinking Wilson, excuses. Wilson I, well, you, you, you're making a hollow point here, and the reason is because Why the Maras, the Tishes, and Joe yeah. Shane are the only yeah. people who matter. Nobody else matters. So why why even discuss this hypothetical, which because is I, hollow? I, 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 it's hollow. It I means nothing. You, I, I tell you why. Because I'm sick of every time. Every time people bring out, not just me, everywhere. But don't listen Brian to Dave. them. If no, it's media listen, fodder and garbage, no. don't pay attention to it. No, no, because I want to ask him, though, right? I said the other day, uh, okay, well, you know, he, he won coach of the year, that's fine, but yet last year he, he was horrendous as a head coach. He was horrendous. He was the worst head coach in the NFL. You know what I keep hearing? Well, if the Giants won two more games, like they were, they were, they could have won the Buffalo game and they could have won the Jets game. It would have been this way. And you know what I say? They, 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 they also should have lost against the Cardinals and they should have lost against against the New England. Patriots. Right, Wilson, so they, we're up against it because our guest is going to be on in a minute. So I got to let you go. But I'm going to give you a second to respond, yeah, respond Jonathan, to because quite frankly, <clears throat> to say that he was a horrible head coach last year couldn't be further from the truth. This this team played hard for him despite numerous obstacles, specifically injuries at key positions, and they fought tooth and nail right down to the very last snap. So I would disagree with your assessment. And, Wilson, there's only like maybe two or three head coaches that are like safe in terms of if their team goes 0-17, you know. But yeah. like if the Giants are horrendous next year and they only win a couple of games, like – no matter who's the coach, they're going to be on the hot seat. Yeah. Like, not just from from upstairs, from the fan base. Our fan base, we are we are aggressive. We are – we don't have patience, you know. So, he's safe now, but if the Giants don't perform next year, no one is safe. Head coach, GM, any player on a team, success is the only thing that makes your job secure. That's the only thing. And even with that, Peyton Manning got cut at one time. Peyton Manning, the best player in the league. Like, this this league is not for long, and it's a performance-based league. And if the Giants can't figure out how to perform better, not only he, everyone's going to be on the hot seat. Everyone's job is up in the air. The Giants need to perform well. This is a performance-based business, and the Giants have to perform well, and I think they will. Ultimately, regardless of the time frame, poor results will get get you a, a walk through the door. Yeah. At some point in time, For whatever sure. the timetable is, if you continue to have poor results, you won't be around. Yeah. And that goes for everybody, except for maybe uh, Mike Tomlin. That's what I'm saying. Who, Tomlin, who, course, Andy Reid. There's like two who, or three. Of course, Tomlin never <clears throat> finishes at the 500. The 500. So, so guess what? He's allowed to stay. Right. Oh, appreciate the phone call. 201-939-4513. It is time to get to the uh, NFL Draft Prospect Preview portion of our program. And that means we send it out to the West Coast, specifically the Pacific Far West. And we preview the Washington Huskies with Dave Softy Miller, host at KJR Radio in Seattle, and a longtime friend of the program, Softy, Paul Dottino, Jonathan Casillas with you. So glad uh, for you to be able to join us today. A uh, long-time friend. Let's not go nuts, Paul. All right? Acquaintances. <laughs> right? I know your Seahawks fans don't like me very much, but that's okay. 
acquaintances. No, we love you out here on the east, on the uh, west coast, man. And yeah, it's been uh, it's been a crazy, crazy year for football in Seattle. Pete Carroll gets fired. Kalen DeBoer takes off for Alabama after going to the national championship game. You got a guy that finished his second in the Heisman Trophy race in Michael Penix. You got a bunch of potential first round draft picks. Thirteen Husky players at the combine in Indy. So mm-hmm. it's been quite the ride the last few months, man. All right, my friend. So let's talk about my guy for the Giants at pick number six. If I get to make the pick, and Joe Shane's not going to let me do that, okay? I've already been told, Dottino, keep your hands off the card, all right? So there's nothing I can do about it. But Romo Dunze is my guy at six, unless Marvin Harrison should somehow fall to the Giants. I don't see that happening. The nitpickers will tell you, and I've asked every one of our guests who have come on to talk about one of the blue chip top ten guys to nitpick this blue chip prospect. And tell me, what could possibly be wrong with him? What would be the blemishes? The only thing that I could say is he doesn't have world-class speed. I get that. And maybe, maybe he's not great coming off of the releases. But then again, how much was he pressed at Washington anyway? Yeah, I think you're nitpicking big time. There you uh, go. Which is exactly what you just said. I think if Roma Dunes a played for Alabama or Florida State or Notre Dame or Ohio State or Michigan, I think he'd be the top receiver off the board. I honestly believe that, man. I mean, this guy is a stud in, in every sense of the word. First of all, he's a phenomenal kid, phenomenal guy. He's, he's without ego. He treats everybody with respect from the head coach to the janitor. So that's number one. You're going to love working with and covering Rome if the Giants do take him. Number two, there's just nothing he can't do, right? The 50-50 ball, he's going to be aggressive. He's going to be physical. He's got hands like butter. He's going to fight for every ball and actually win almost every 50-50 battle you throw his way. If you press him, he'll be able to shuck you and run right by you. Uh, if you want to give him the ball on a reverse like they did on fourth and one against Washington State in the Apple Cup deep inside their own territory, he can turn the corner with any wide receiver in college football. So, I just think the guy's being overlooked, and I think he's, look, he's going to be a top-ten pick likely in the NFL draft, but I think even that is overlooking this guy. If he played for a school on the East Coast or in the uh, you know Big Ten, I think he'd be a top-five pick in the draft easily. Wow, that's a lot to say. Um, Paul- you don't have, by the way, Softy, you don't have to sell me, okay? <laughs> you don't have to sell <laughs> no, that- me. I've been talking about him as my yeah, pick yeah. at number six since the combine. Yep. He's my guy. Hey, look, guys, guys I, think, I think maybe one of the knocks on him is that he plays for a pass-happy offense, right? Like, they, they throw the ball a lot at Washington, or they did at least when Ryan Grubb was the offensive coordinator. This guy's getting 10 targets a week, for God's sakes. And let me tell you a story about Roma Dunze, all right? Because you guys both know, and, yeah, John, you know this better than I do. you got to play hurt in the NFL, right? You cannot play right. uh, in the NFL unless you're willing to suck it up and play hurt. So we go to Arizona. I think it's week four or five of the season. Roma Dunze punctures a lung against Arizona. Can't fly home because mm-hmm. the doctors won't let him fly. So his mom and some trainers took turns driving him from Tucson to Seattle, and luckily the Huskies had a bye that week. The next week was the Oregon game, where he went bananas on the Oregon Ducks, number seven team in the country, I believe at the time, had the game-winning touchdown where he fought for a ball that was thrown over a cornerback's head, and he wins the game with a punctured lung. Two weeks later, after puncturing his lung, this guy is on the field ripping apart the Oregon Duck defense. So if you want a guy who's going to play hurt, if you want a guy who's going to suck it up and be physical with a punctured freaking lung, Roma Dunes is your man. Did we sell you? I like it. Softy, you sold me on him. But just like Paul was, and Paul's, you know, he's a layup guy. He's not going to slam it home when I say that. (laughs) Because the NFL is going to be a lot more critical than Paul. They're going to look at his film, and they're not going to say anything positive about him. They're going to look at all of his negatives, right? So one thing that I can see from him, and it might be a positive thing to some people, but I think it doesn't translate well in the NFL is his ability to create space. Mm-hmm. Like a Devontae Adams, like a Keenan Allen. And I say Keenan Allen because I think they're very similar guys that aren't the Blazers of the world. Decent route runners, Keenan Allen, elite route runner, but he creates space. Roman Dunze, he does catch a lot of contested passes. And right. I would say a lot of GM scouts and coaches will argue 
that he doesn't create enough space for them. I think yeah, that's like, my only critical argument because he does have a high uh, contested catch rate. And I think one of the reasons why, because he doesn't create enough space. And in the NFL, you need to create space. I think that's my only knock on him. And I'm sure the scouts all over the NFL would say a little bit more than that. But that's my yeah. only my only critical statement against him. And I don't know well, how well that translates over to the NFL. Yeah, look, and, and I get it. When you're about to invest, you know, a top 10 pick in somebody, maybe even as high as number six, and you're going to put your career on the line in some ways as a GM or a head coach in a 23-year-old kid, you want to go over everything with a fine-tooth comb, and I totally get that. But, I, guys, I saw Roma Dunze lose plenty of defenders in college. Plenty, okay? So I don't think that's as big a concern as some people are making it out to be. Maybe it's not his strength, but if you were to call that a weakness of his, then the weakness is still pretty damn strong, all right? I mean, somebody's got to have a weakness. Somebody's got to have a strength. But how weak is your weakness? Is it terrible? Is it average? Is it above average? I think Roma Dunze is still very much above average at creating space and losing defenders. And I do think that when he gets into, into a situation where he's not creating the space that you're talking about, he makes up for it with incredible strength and incredible hands. So I, I'm just not concerned about the guy. I don't have any concerns about Roma Dunze at the next level. And, guys, i got to tell you, as a dude who's been covering Washington football for 30 years, I'm normally over-the-top critical of Washington players because I've seen all of them, and I know what they can do and what they can't do, and I don't want them to embarrass anybody in the NFL. <laughs> in this situation, I think Roma Dunze is as slam-dunk a wide receiver in the NFL as I've ever seen. Now, I don't know if the Giants are the right spot for him, to be totally honest with you, because I have no idea who's going to be throwing the guy the football. A place like Kansas City, for example, would be unbelievable for him. Uh, playing indoors in a place like Minnesota would be great, but again, they have no quarterback. I just think that Roma Dunze is as, is as big a lock to have a long 10-plus year career in the NFL as any Washington receiver I've ever seen. And that goes back to Reggie Williams, guys. Reggie Williams was a top-10 pick in the NFL sure. draft, but he was kind of a meathead, had kind of a pothead problem. He doesn't have that issue. Roma Dunze is a guy that you would let every daughter in your family date and feel no concern about it whatsoever. And, and I don't want to leave this left unsaid, Softy. Uh, he's not afraid to use his frame to block either. No, not at all. He's an incredible blocker. Guys, go back and look at the, I, I, I'm telling you, the Wazoo game, the Washington State game, the Oregon State game, when they needed a quick first down, they went to Roma Dunze on the sideline, lost his defender. You want to look at a guy creating space? Go look at that play against Oregon State <laughs> that won the game for Washington. And you tell me if he can't lose players. All right. Before we get to Michael Penix Yeah, man, I worked up here, John. Oh, I love I it, like Softy. It, Softy. It's early in the morning out there. Are, are you sure you're okay now? Before we get to Michael Penix Jr., because there's a lot of people yeah. here who want to talk about quarterbacks. I get that. Right. I just want to ask right. you about Jalen Polk because he is the yeah. other spectacular receiver that Washington has, who will be gone by the end of day two. I don't think there's much doubt right. about that. In a deep wide receiver class, how do you rate him based on what you've seen out there with the Huskies? Well, I would actually, uh, honestly, I would take McMillan over Polk. They got hmm. three of them. They got, they got a Dunze, they got Jalen McMillan, and they got Jalen Polk. The, the issue with McMillan, if you look at his numbers, his numbers aren't going to jump off the page this year because he was banged up for a long time and missed almost two months of football. All right? He, uh, he twisted his knee against Michigan State, and from that point on, he never really was the same kind of guy. Uh, go back and look at the Texas game that McMillan had in the Sugar Bowl. Go look at the Pac-12 championship that McMillan had against Oregon. So his numbers aren't going to be there because he missed a bunch of time, but he is the most, I think, complete route runner on the Washington football team. He may not have the physical skills that Roma Dunze has, but he can really run every route in the route tree. Uh, he's probably a day two, if not an early day three guy, or excuse me, a round three guy. Jalen Polk is also sensational. I mean, Jalen Polk is a guy who's going to find a way to get open subtly. Kind of reminds me in some ways of Steve Largent for all the old guys like me and Paul that remember <laughs> that name from 50 years ago. He's not going to be flashy, but he's going to find a way slippery and sneaky to get open, and he's not going to be a guy that's going to have the drops. He had about a two-week stretch last year where he could not catch a football, and it shocked everybody. Oregon State in the rain had a hard time catching the ball. Wazoo had a hard time catching the ball, 
And then all of a sudden, the Husky coaching staff pulled him aside, and they put on a tape of him making incredible catches and said, look, dude, this is who you are. And he went out against the Oregon Ducks, and he was sensational in the biggest game of the year, the Pac-12 championship. So for, yeah, for me, McMillan's number two and Polk is number three. Wow. But out of Polk and McMillan, when you look at these guys, because I haven't really seen them. Of course, I've watched yeah. uh, Adunze. Yeah, on, you're on, on the East Coast. You guys don't film. watch West Coast football out there. I get it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> are are they? Would you consider these guys physical guys? Because as as Paul knows, I'm always trying to see if they can fit into special teams. You know, right. and not just yeah. like as a yeah. returner because they play wide receiver. I'm talking about yeah. gunner. I'm talking about running down on kickoff plays. And now yeah. kickoff now is is going to be back. I, I think back in you know intertwined back into the NFL. It's kind of been right. done away with the last few years. And kickoff, you know, it's a huge field position deal. And wide receivers that may get picked up later in these rounds, they have to do well on special teams. What do you think Correct. about them when you think of their physicality and their mindset in terms of special teams? I, th- I think Rome is in a, in a league by himself. Not him. When it comes not, to not Rome. Physicality. He's not playing special teams. <laughs> yeah, you're not, He's you're not, not playing special him. teams. I'm not, not talking about him. <laughs> I'm, I'm just telling you that you could use him as a punt returner. Washington did use Roma Dunze in, in a pinch as a punt returner. He's got that in his game. Now, if you're drafting him number six, you're not doing that, obviously, in the NFL. I'm just telling you that from a physical perspective, Rome is in a category by himself. And then I would say McMillan, and then I would say Jalen Polk. I mean, I would have no problem using McMillan as a gunner on special teams. Polk's frame may not be built for that in the National Football League. He may have to put on some more weight. Yeah. All right, let's get to the big guy because uh, there's a lot of hype about Michael Penix Jr. Now, Softy. Let me, let me just come right out and say this. Forget right. about watching any tape on him. The four season ending injuries for me before he even gets into the NFL draft, right. that for me is automatically a huge, huge no no. And, and aside from even watching him, I know he's got okay. the best cannon of any quarterback in this class. I understand right. that. But that injury file. I'm sorry. I cannot I cannot digest that. So let's put that aside because there'll be yep. some people who are willing to ignore it, others like me who are going to say that means he can't he can't be on the shelf for me. Talk mm-hmm. about what you see from him positively and negatively as a yeah. performer aside from the injury concern. Well, I mean, first of all, you can't say something like that and expect me to ignore it. OK, you can't you can't you can't just throw out the, you know, he's off the board for me. You can't you can't throw that out there and then just think I'm going to shut up and move on to the next topic. Okay? Get him, softy. Get him. Holly, it's been a major, major topic of conversation up here in Seattle. And I just think this. I think he just got done starting 28 games in a row. He played two months in a row with a bruised rib. All right. He can play hurt in the NFL. There's no issue with, with, uh, with this guy. The, the days of being concerned about the knees and him getting over all that, I think are over. Did you see his vertical leap at the pro day in Seattle, for God's sakes? You tell me if the guy's got knee problems with that vertical leap. You saw his 40-yard dash. You tell me if there's problems with that knee structurally. So I'm not concerned about it whatsoever. And what's going to happen, Paul, is there's going to be a GM out there who's going to think just like you. All right, and they're going to pass on Michael Penix. So Michael Penix is going to fall in the draft to a place like Seattle, for example, who already has two tackles, a ready-made wide receiver core, a ready-made running back core, and they're going to let Michael Penix sit for a year behind a guy like Geno Smith, who was with you guys for a while, obviously, Mm -hmm. and has now resurrected himself in Seattle. And he's going to learn how to play in the NFL. And by the time it comes to play Michael Penix, he's going to be put in a position where he's not going to have to do everything because the entire offense is going to be set around him. If you put Michael Penix in a situation where the offensive line stinks and the wide receivers stink and there's there's no running game whatsoever, and you do to him what Justin Fields did to Chicago, of course he's going to have a hard time in the NFL. But if you do to him what the Seahawks did to Russell Wilson in 2012, when they had the league's highest-paid offensive line, and they had Marshawn Lynch and Michael mm-hmm. Robinson and Golden Tate and Doug Baldwin and Sidney Rice, and they had uh, you know Zach Miller at tight end, and you put him in that situation where you let him sit, sit behind a offense that is good to go and he's not having to do everything himself, this guy is going to have massive success in the NFL. I'm telling you. Now, to the arm. A lot of people look at arm strength and they – 
and they say and they see arm strength based on how far a guy can throw a ball. And that's part of it. And this guy can throw it 60 yards, no problem. What I'm looking at is a guy who can get a ball across the field to a spot the size a of a laser beam. frisbee. He throws a laser beam. Seconds. I know. Within seconds. All right? His accuracy is unbelievable. And if you're concerned about him stepping away from pressure, if you're sitting here, Paul, living in some kind of world where the Giants won't be able to protect him, I would implore you, go watch the Sugar Bowl. Go watch the game he had against Devondre Sweat and Byron Murphy, and the way he stepped away from pressure in that game was a master class and how to elude pressure from some pretty damn good defensive linemen. If you're concerned about that, go watch the Sugar Bowl, and then you call me, and then we'll have that conversation about whether or not Michael Penix can step away from pressure. Pearson, my, my poor producer, actually thinks you're serious. No, no, it's okay. He and I my go God, back a long driving way. driving me nuts out here. We, we, so, softy, softy, here's the thing, though. Like you just said a, a, a couple of moments ago, you were outlining conditions and circumstances that would right. certainly be conducive to him right. becoming the player that you want him to be. And I get right. that. But see, here's the problem. If you're going well, to use if you're going to use a high first round pick on him and you don't right. have the conditions in place that will make it yes. conducive for him, as yes. you said, they don't take him. Nah, it's they a don't problem. That you can't take him. You can't. They don't take him. That's fine. Unless you're willing to let the guy sit while you restructure your offensive yeah. line. Yeah, and, and that could and that could take two to three years for some teams, and maybe gonna, longer. I, I, I think, Honestly, softly, Paul, I think him not being drafted early is going to help him. I Am think I? The, the, the situation, no the scenario you presented, Softy, would be great for any of these quarterbacks. But the, the truth of the matter is, Caleb Williams, he's getting drafted number one overall. He doesn't yeah. have that luxury. He is going to no, play no. right away. And, you know, but Caleb you know, Chicago's is a not a player. Not a he's decent, a different player than Michael Pettis. Yeah, yeah but, but still, player. though, it's still an adjustment. From the right. college level to the pro level, I don't care what you look like in college. It's just a different level. These guys, like the guys that you guys played against on a consistent basis, one or right. two of those guys are 10-year veterans. One or two of those. That's it. No question. You're no going to go against 10-year veterans on a consistent basis on the, in the NFL. And I think right. the scenario that you presented, that would be optimistic for any quarterback. Honestly, what I think, any though. player, Here's but it think, doesn't though. happen like okay. that, you know? Right. Okay, let me just jump in here for a second, okay? Because now I'm getting all worked up now, okay? So, so here, <laughs> I like it. Here's the thing. There, like are, there are quarterbacks who can handle that because of their athleticism. Michael Penix can run, but Michael Penix is not Caleb Williams, and his body is not built like Caleb right, Williams. Right. I, I, saw, I saw Caleb Williams play in person in L.A. Uh, in, the, uh, in November in the Washington-USC game, and I was absolutely blown away by, by Caleb Williams. I mean, bringing him down to the ground is nearly impossible. So there's going to be teams that won't be able to protect their quarterback as much as other teams will, and then there's going to be quarterbacks that will be able to get out of pressure and break tackles. Michael Penix cannot break tackles, but he can evade pressure. There's a difference. Caleb Williams can break tackles. Caleb Williams can have a guy wrapped around him like a freaking hot dog bun, and he can find a way to get away from that. So I think Caleb Williams is maybe a better fit for a place like Chicago than he is a place like Seattle. But I, I just think this in the end, guys. If you're looking for elite, elite NFL arm talent, if you're looking for leadership, if you're looking for a guy who can play hurt, and he proved he can play hurt, no question about that, Michael Penix is your man. If you're concerned about the injury history from you know three, four years ago from Indiana, when the guy has started 28 games in a row, if that's got you worked up, then forget it. But I think those days are over for Michael Penix. I really do. I, first of all, this guy is so impressive. Like I, I watched him. I watched the game. I watched highlights, and then I, I watched. Thought you were talking about me, like a cut up. You're, you're very impressive too, <laughs> Softy. I love this conversation. I was like, thanks, man. But the what Paul is saying, he's not talking about him playing hurt. He's talking about the injury history. And I told Paul right. because we've had conversations about injuries plenty of times on this show, and I think there's right. just some people that are just going to get hurt or injured, and I think some people like more than other people, like uh uh um. Rondé Barber, he played 17 right. years, barely got injured. Ray Lewis played, I don't know, 20 years, mm -hmm. barely got injured. I played nine years, I was injured every single year. You know what I mean? Like, there's people that are just going to be hurt. And I think Paul is kind of in that same category. He's like, he might be one of those guys. So Paul's I out. And I think he's Paul's not alone. 
There's other GMs, head coaches, scouts, and managers that are like, we don't even have Penix on our board. So the, the scenario you presented I think is perfect for him, but this is my only knock on him because when you get to the NFL, these corners are a lot quicker, they're a lot faster, their technique are imp- is impeccable at this level. Timing yep. is a is a number one priority, I think, for most of these quarterbacks that are in systems that he doesn't have to create outside the pocket. Penix's feet is a little bit sloppy, just a little bit. I, I see sometimes he's throwing these quick passes and his feet are not set. Mm-hmm. And that could be a big problem on the next level, Softy. What do you have against that? Um, nothing against that. I think, I think that you're talking about an imperfect product that needs to develop. And I think that there's a lot of quarterbacks in the NFL that will have knocks on them. I, I, I don't think there's anybody coming into the draft right now where you can say there's nothing wrong with this guy whatsoever. Everything is perfect. And if you're telling me that his footwork – is what he needs to work on, that can be corrected, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're telling yeah. me that a guy has no arm strength whatsoever, I mean, that's not going to fix itself. You, right. you either have it or you don't. Yep. But if, if, if you're telling me that your biggest problem with Michael Penix is his footwork, hey, get me a coordinator. <laughs> get me a quarterback. <laughs> I'm with you. That. that is my only problem I have with him. <laughs> that's it. He's, John, he's John, amazing. I guess I would also just say this about the injury history. And I get it. There's people that will freak out about that. How many games in a row would the guy have to start before you say the injury history is no longer valid? I mean, it sounds like hey, it only comes up when he gets hurt. hurt. That's it. Yeah. When he get, let's say he plays five years in the league and something happens to him. Knock on wood. I hope nothing ever happens to that kid. But let's say something happened to him five years down the road. They're gonna be like, oh yeah, he had four injuries in college to the yeah. same knee. Which like totally that's unfair, gonna. Right? I know it is unfair. Totally I agree with you. Hopefully, he gives you five years before he gets hurt. Yeah. You right. just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, softy. Before you go, I want to ask you yeah. about two of the two of the offensive linemen in particular because we were just talking right. about that. Rose. Yep. Garden, and then obviously for Tanu, way up top. Yep. Uh, right. g- give me a capsule on these two guys because let's not kid ourselves. Penix benefited a lot from an offensive line that was like a brick wall. No question, he did. And uh, that brick wall, actually, Scotty Huff, who was the there was only one coach that Kalen DeBoer kept from Jimmy Lake's staff when Jimmy got fired when they went four and eight. And that was Scott Huff, who was their offensive line coach. Imagine that. The offense was a friggin' mess under Jimmy Lake in his last year. And the only guy that Kalen kept was the, was the offensive line coach. And now Scott Huff is coaching the Seahawks offensive line, by the way, along with Ryan Grubb. So offensive line, tremendous, no question about it. Troy Fatanu can play left tackle and left guard. He played left guard for a while when Jackson Kirkland was here at left tackle. Then when Jackson got hurt, they put him at left tackle, and he stayed there forever. Uh, he's just he's just a completely polished product at, yeah. at, at left tackle. I mean, this guy is a is a Pro Bowl potential All Pro caliber left tackle for 10, 15 years in the National Football League. I mean, he's just he doesn't get hurt, right? He never whines, never moans, never complains. You never hear his name called ever because he never gives up a sack. Rarely gets called for a penalty. Um, if I'm looking for a left tackle, Trey Fontano, maybe right in the middle of the draft, middle of the first round, would be it would be absolutely a guy that I would target. And then Roger Rosengarten um, is a guy that started as a redshirt freshman last year at right tackle. You don't see a lot of offensive linemen mm-hmm. start as freshmen or redshirt freshmen in college football. And when they do, they normally start on the interior at yep. center or guard. This guy was starting at right tackle as a 19-year-old kid, as a redshirt freshman last year. And if you watch the Reese's Senior Bowl workouts, he never gave up a sack when he was down there. I mean, he was absolutely a star of the show at that game. He's also a phenomenal guy. Look, all these dudes are phenomenal guys. Every Washington player that played for Kalen DeBoer, they're all going to be guys of high character. So I'm not concerned about any of them getting in trouble. But Rosengarten at right tackle and Fontana at left tackle, absolutely to me, reek of guys that can have long 10-plus years in the NFL. Uh, Softy, we've got one more minute left. I'm going to go off the board for a second and ask you about Drew Locke. We know what happened with Geno Smith, turned his career around 180 degrees in Seattle. Drew Locke had a great game against the Philadelphia Eagles last year when he finally got a chance to play. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He didn't? No, he didn't. No, he didn't. No, no. Go back and look at where he was before that fourth quarter. He was having a horrible game. Well, horrible we never game. we never got to see the whole game out here. That's the problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, just go look at the box. What, score, what, man. I mean, he was doing What, what he should doing, we know? All right. So what should we know about Drew Locke? Real quick before we let you go. I, he's just a career backup. 
That's all he is, and that's fine. I mean, every team needs a backup quarterback, right? And mm-hmm. Drew Locke, I think, is maybe uh, you know above average when it comes to backup quarterbacks from the National Football League. But if you're looking for a star to replace Daniel Jones, you know, Drew, Daniel Jones gets hurt, Locke steps in, Wally Pips. Daniel Jones and becomes Luke Perry. Forget it. That, that, that's not going to happen. There's a reason why the Seahawks let this guy go on a one-year $5 million deal, okay? It, it's, just, it's just not anything to even be thinking about. I mean, Drew Locke is going to be a backup quarterback for the rest of his career, and that's it, that's all. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Softy, always appreciate the time, my friend. Dave Softy Miller, host of KJR Radio out in Seattle. Uh, a long-time friend and a good, good associate of the program. Jonathan, what, can, what, what, what else do you want to say to this I man? I mean, I wanted to ask him about Braylon Trice. And oh, go ahead. Real have quick. 30 seconds. I don't know if that's enough time for you, Softy. Give me t- something yeah, about no, Braylon, Braylon Trice. Bra- yeah, Braylon started off a little slow last year and then really picked it up as the year went on. Um, he didn't have a lot of help last year at the defensive end position or even the pass rush position. He was really the only big-time pass rusher on the Husky football team last year. So he was facing a lot of double teams, at least early in the year. And then Zion Tupola Fatui kind of got going a little bit later in the year. They started bringing some heat from their back end. But Braylon Trice, uh, you know, kind of reminds me of uh, Joe Tryon, who's now at Tampa Bay, you know, where he really popped and had the one good year and then kind of rode that to, you know, a first-round pick in the NFL draft. I don't know if Braylon Trice is a first-round pick, probably a second-round pick, if not an early third-round pick. But he's a guy that's got some quicks. He's not as fast as the great elite edge rushers out there. But if you're looking for a guy who can maybe win the 50-50 battle every now and then, great. But if you're looking for a guy who's going to be getting home and just beating tackles to death in the NFL, that's probably not your dude. Um, I'm kind of curious where he plays in the NFL. Is he an outside linebacker? Is he a you know hand on the ground, you know, uh, you know four three, te- you know defensive end? Um, I'm curious to know where they put him in the uh, at the next level, but he's a guy that really came into the league, or excuse me, his last year with a ton of hype and had a hard time meeting it for the first couple months and then really blew up at the, at the end of the year. Uh, it kind of got closer. So I like him, but not enough to take him in the first round. Softy, we'll talk again during the season. we got to find out where the schedule makers have the Giants coming back out to Seattle. It seems as though that's been a regular occurrence in recent years. And then I get to uh, to tick off your Seahawks uh, listeners yeah. when we do our chat. <laughs> Always yeah, good to Paul talk to you, man. the air and tells the Seahawks fans how the Hawks have no shot. <laughs> and the Giants get smoked, and he has to come back on the air and apologize. <laughs> Softy, stay well, okay? Nice meeting you, Softy. Okay, boy, see ya. Be good, my man. Dave Softy Miller, KJR Radio out in Seattle. He I've known that man awesome. a long time. He was awesome. You know, us energized people, we, we travel in packs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? He was awesome. He's one of my guys. He was awesome. Uh, all right, folks. <laughs> that'll do it for this edition of the program. Do I have to read a spot here, uh, Pearson? No spots? You know what? <laughs> we just had so much with Softy. I just want to remind you, catch an archive of this show and our entire podcast network on Giants.com slash podcasts and all of your podcast platforms everywhere. For Jonathan Casillas, I'm Paul Dottino. We'll catch you next time on Big Blue Kickoff Live.